All right, thank you. Um, tonight, again, Lord willing, I want to take a look at, um, let's see. Hold on one second, let me get the document. Oh, that's not the one. There it is. Samson and the Lion. And this is a little bit of a review. We, I've offered some verses the last time looking at the carcass of the lion. And we want to try to maybe expand on this a little more. Look at the, uh, the account of Samson. And then we'll pick up some of the verses that I offered the last time and see whether or not uh, you know we've come to understand this uh, in the light of uh, what the rest of the Bible is teaching now let me go ahead and post this heading with Samson and the lion this I believe oops there's a typo there I left out the uh, yeah I left out the uh, the article the in the uh, in the title anyway Christ defeating Satan that's what I believe is in view here Christ defeats Satan in order to win the elect that pleased him and the last time what I offered there is that in order to do this Christ had to come against against whom He had to come against the opposition, right? And in Judges chapter 14, verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now do you suppose that this is perhaps significant? That this woman that Samson is interested in, she is from... From the land of the Philistines. Were the Philistines the enemies of, of Christ? And he came up and told his father and, and his mother. And said, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for wife. Get her for me to, to wife. So he is interested in, uh, in this woman. In verse 3. And then, uh, of course, his father says, "Well, uh, anyone else here among the among your people that you might be interested in? Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? The uncircumcised Philistines. And that I think is interesting, isn't it?" Where were the believers prior to the redemption of, of the body of Christ? Where were they? Um, let's see. We'll come back to that. This, I think... Uh, you know, ties in perhaps to Luke chapter 14 verse 5 uh, and answer them saying which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day now is this talking about Sunday when God speaks of the Sabbath we know we had the Old Testament Sabbath uh, the seventh day Sabbath and then uh, in Matthew 28 verse 1 we read about in the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn towards the first of the Sabbath so now we're looking at a new Sabbath but spiritually that too I think uh, we can tie in um, into the the Great Tribulation so Christ had to go out of his way on the Sabbath in order to rescue the ox that falls into the pit and there again I think it's a picture of where the believers were prior to the uh, the redemption the most high welcome that's where the believers were right so that's what I think is in view here Lord willing uh, so 
Samson, who is he typifying at this point? Now I know we talked in the past also that the possibility perhaps that Samson is a type of God and then, oops, hold on one second. Oh, sorry about that. People can be so loud. Um, yeah, so we said that perhaps Samson was a type of God and then the lion would be a type of Christ. Now, I, I used to, you know, believe that uh, in the past, but today, by God's grace, I think, looking at the language of the Bible more carefully, uh, that does not seem to fit the overall picture. I don't see the Bible to be confirming that Christ, or God, is wrestling with Christ in order to bring the believers to salvation. Okay, so that, that's what I believe is in view here. Uh, and then in verse 5, let's see if that'll post. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnah, and that's a portion of Judah, the word Timnah, and came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion roared against him. So who is this lion? We know that Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So again, is it possible that Christ might be in view here? See, this is one of these areas where we, you know, it could go both ways. We can have a, uh, you know, one word uh, that points to Christ, but at the same time, it could also point to Antichrist. So which one is it going to be? Well, I think, uh, Lord willing, we have to look at enough information, enough verses in the Bible to see uh, whether or not, um, you know, to try to see where the salvation account lies. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 15, As a roaring lion and a ranging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the people. Bear with me one second. Uh, and then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion. The adversary, who is that? Is that Christ? As a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, and then we have, for example, uh, well, we know the adversary. That has to be, yeah, exactly, green eyes. That, that has to be Satan. Christ is not the adversary. He is not the enemy. He is the enemy of Satan. But as far as the believers, the enemy would have to be the unsaved in the church, headed up by Satan. Psalm 74, verse 4, Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregation. They set up their enzymes. Um, a couple of more verses. Psalm 17, verse 12. Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. So who's that talking about? What about Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 38? The context here, I think, is looking at Babylon, the dragons. They shall roar together like lions, they shall yell as lions whelps. So again, who do you suppose this roaring lion here that comes against Samson? Who is that? Uh, that didn't post. Hold on one second. Uh, Job chapter 4. May I have to break it up. Job chapter 4 verse 10. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion. And the teeth of the young lions are broken. <clears throat> there I think we're looking at God, God's judgment on, on Babylon at the time when Christ is revealed. So the roaring lion, the young lion, all of that I believe, uh, and when we try to analyze the overall context of uh, Judges chapter 14, that lion there I propose, it has to be a, uh, a type of Satan coming against Christ, right? That would be Samson. And then we read, 
in verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. The Spirit of the Lord. Well, again, we have to search the Bible, right? What happened here? Uh, let's see. I thought I... How did that happen? All right, we'll probably have to come back. I I separated uh, some of these verses, so they may not be in, in sequence. Uh, we're going to come back to the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Samson. In verse 7, And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. Now, we're not going to look at the verses related to this, but I, I, I believe if you search the Bible, you'll find that uh, the idea of pleasing something or pleasing someone it relates again to salvation. Now Christ, typified by Samson, is going after his bride. He is going after uh, the elect because she pleases Christ. And as I said before, but before, uh, prior to the, uh, prior to Christ, able to bring the believers out of the pits, out of Babylon. We talk about the collective salvation, the redemption of the body. He had to first bind the strong man, right? So in verse uh, 8, And after a time he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. So he defeated, he wrestled with the lion, and he killed the lion. And now we're looking at the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And the word carcass here is often translated ruin or fall, as in the fall of Babylon. Ezekiel 31 verse 13, Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain. Ezekiel 26 verse 18, Now shall all the, now shall all the isles tremble in the day of thy fall. And we, we've looked at, uh, I've offered some of these verses before, uh, just kind of recapping here and again showing that the carcass of the lion, the dead carcass of the lion, is a picture of uh, Christ defeating Satan. He had to bind the strong man. And then we start reading about the swarm of bees and honey and the carcass of the lion. Well, we might easily think or perhaps uh, come to the conclusion that the bees, the honey, and the carcass of the lion, that that has to be a reference to the unsaved. And that's the way that I used to look at these verses. But I don't think, Lord willing, that the Bible is supporting this, but rather the fact that because Christ was victorious over Satan, it is the victory of Christ that calls for the salvation of the body. So the honey there, the bees, I think it's pointing to the great multitude, a swarm of bees. And that's what happened. Because Christ defeated Satan both at the cross as well as uh, at the revelation of Christ, he made war. Remember, that? I think we read about that in the book of Revelation. Shall Michael stand up uh, for the children of thy people? So he makes war with Satan spiritually. And then uh, after the defeat, now he is able to bring the elect out of Babylon. We read uh, in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 18, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss, that is to whistle, for the fly that is in the uttermost parts of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Now, there's some language in the Bible if we, uh, where the bees are typifying the unsaved, the locusts. And again, that's not surprising because we read about the uh, the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the air, uh, the beasts of the field. They can, you know, these I believe are looking at those in the church, in the body of Christ. But depending on the context, they could be uh, looking at the unsaved or the believers. So God here is going to hiss. And notice here in Zechariah 10, verse 8, I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them. So there I propose. That's the language of salvation. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 26. 
and he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12, and he shall set up an ensign. And the word ensign there again, uh, I think it's pointing to Christ. Uh, but we'll probably have to come back and, and look at uh, some related verses there. Um, he shall set up an ensign for the nation and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah. Those who were scattered in tribulation, God is now gathering them. Isaiah chapter 18 verse 3, All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye, when he lifteth up an ensign, on the mountains hear ye so there again now as I said uh, some of these verses uh, you know we shared uh, in the last study so we'll try and take it one step further okay continue looking at the uh, the fact that the honey the sweetness that comes from the strong and there again I think uh, just looking at verse 14 of Judges, uh, Judges chapter 14 that might be a clue and he said unto them out of the eater came forth meat and out of the strong came forth sweetness isn't that interesting who is the strong is that Christ no again I offered before that what I believe is in view there is that God is looking at Satan the unsaved in the church and the body of Christ so out of the strong, well, Christ is strong, so that's a possibility. We can search the Bible and find language that relate to that. Uh, but we also find verses in the same context that are looking at Satan as the one who is strong. And Christ is stronger than, than Satan. Numbers 13, 28, nevertheless, the people be strong the people be strong that dwell in the land that's the land that they had to possess the Amorites the uh, the Canaanites uh, after the uh, the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt so God refers to them at, and God had to drive them out right and that was uh, spiritually I think was typifying uh, the fact that God has removed the unsaved spiritually now from the kingdom from the body of Christ so they are driven out so that the elect would inherit the land as God unseals the Bible to them. So nonetheless, it's a, a strong nation, a strong people, Deuteronomy 28 verse 50, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old. Um, 2 Samuel 22 verse 18, He delivered me from my strong enemy. We said earlier that the enemy is Satan. He delivered me from my strong enemy. Uh, so I think we can see that that's exactly uh, what happened here with Samson defeating the lion. That was a strong enemy. That's the enemy that was keeping the elect from a relationship with Christ in the context of the separation, the depart out. Psalm 59, verse 3. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul, the mighty. That's the strong. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. Matthew tw uh, chapter 12, verse 29. How can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his goods. <clears throat> now, can you see how this would tie in? I believe with Revelation chapter 20, the angel that comes down uh, comes down from heaven, and he took hold on the on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Not at the cross, although there might be an implication there that the cross also, uh, you know, this happened because God began His uh, program to evangelize the world. But more specifically, I think uh, these verses are pointing to what happens when God delivers His people from the enemy, from Babylon. Let me break up 
this verse. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Now going back to the Spirit of the Lord that came on Samson mightily. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Uh, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So there it is again. The elect, they are bound uh, corporately, uh, being one body. Let both grow together until the harvest. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, that's Christ, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Okay, now we read about Samson. He takes of the honey. Now, there again, I, I think is another reason, uh, perhaps, to you know come to the conclusion that the honey that he is eating, and then he goes back home and, and offers uh, the same honey to his mother and father. So the honey there, I believe, would have to be pointing to the gospel. So that would be uh, relating to salvation. Out of the strong came forth sweetness. The word of God is sweet, right, to the taste. So he went on eating and came to his father and mother and gave them, he gave them, and they did eat. Now, the interesting thing here is that we read a couple of verses, for example, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah warned of God of the things of things not seen, as yet moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house. So I'm beginning to suspect when God speaks of, uh, you know, the elect becoming saved and thy house. As we read, for example, in Acts chapter 11, verse 14. Who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? Does this mean, for example, let me go ahead and post the other verse. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now, is this saying that if you become a believer your brother, your sister, your mother, that they too, they will become saved? Is that what's in view here? It's kind of puzzling, isn't it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And the phrase, in thy house, I... I I think it's pointing to the house of God. In other words, it was God's intention to bring all the elect, all the elect, 144,000. It was God's intention to bring them into the kingdom. They are the ones that are part of the house of God. And God is able to reach them through the sharing of, of the gospel. So someone does become saved, uh, God can use them. That doesn't mean that someone has to be saved for God to... I uh, use the gospel uh, to bring to others to salvation. But I think the, the house of God, the Lord willing, is in view here. Uh, and then we read in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 22. And has given them this land which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. That's the promised land. Milk and honey. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 15 Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Samson was eating honey. Honey that he got from the carcass of the lion. Now I know I, I've thought about the idea well how can you you get honey that is the gospel from a dead carcass that is typifying Satan. Right? That's probably the first question we might have. Uh, we can take a look at some of the other verses uh, and, and you know try to come back to that. Uh, but here, butter and honey shall he eat. My son, Proverbs 24, verse 13, eat thou honey because it is good. Now there is too much honey. The Bible, I believe, also speaks of too much honey. Just like too much wine can cause someone to become 
Uh, servant, hi, welcome to the room. Yeah, from time to time, uh, you know, the, the room is closed, but if you, I'm not sure if you're aware of the, uh, the schedule. Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, we come live on the mic. Uh, and then in between, from time to time, uh, you know, we, uh, we can open the room for a general uh, broadcast. Okay, so my son, eat thou honey because it is good. So honey there, I believe, is typifying Christ. It is typifying the gospel. That's the honey that Samson takes from the carcass of the lion, and then he begins to eat. Right? But the honey comes from, where did the honey come from? What made the honey? I don't want to seem too uh, trivial there. Uh, of course, the bees, right? Yeah, the bees. Well, again, the question is, is it possible that the bees now would be typifying the elect or Satan? So there again, I think the bees are typifying the believers. A swarm of bees. A swarm of bees. That, I believe, is the great multitude. Because when God redeems the church, He redeems the body, we read about a great multitude which no man could number. And that's all the elect, all the believers from the very beginning, I propose. God is now avenging the blood of the martyrs. And then finally, uh, Psalm 119, verse 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So Samson is eating the honey that comes from the bees. And I propose again that the bees there, pointing to the elect, pointing to Christ, the body of Christ itself, that produces the honey. But this salvation comes as a result of the defeat of Babylon, of Satan, the kingdom of Satan. All right, now I'm going to share some other verses from the last study, uh, just as a uh, refresher, the Lord willing, uh, to try and see how it is possible, because we have to allow the Bible. The Bible has to give us the, uh, the information that we need in order to make the connection. We can't simply uh, come to that conclusion and say, well, that's what the Bible is teaching. But let me go ahead and post a, uh, a conclusion here, which... the entire thing I might be able to post. Alright, so Samson there appears to be a type of Christ who defeated Satan, the lion, in order to obtain the woman that pleased him well. Before he could have her, he first had to defeat. He had to make war with the lion, that is Satan, the kingdom of darkness. And that appears to have taken place both at the cross, as I mentioned earlier, and at the revelation of Christ. Okay. All right. Now, let me, uh, the other study, uh, anyone interested, uh, you can find on the website, clean out of an unclean. And I want to go ahead and uh, I'm going to turn off the recorder for the study. And then uh, we'll look at some verses uh, and, and try to see uh, how this might connect. Bear with me one second.